Hey there. My guests today are Nidhi Pant, Prasad Baji, Pankaj Chopra, and Sandeep Kadodia, who goes by Sandy. All members of the COVID committee of a large condo in South Mumbai. A note to our listeners, managing committee members of a housing society or resident welfare association are elected representatives under the Society's Registration Act and carry statutory responsibilities. Vidhi is a chartered accountant and worked with the Tata Group for several years before taking up even more challenging responsibilities as a stay-at-home mom and committee member. Prasad is an engineer from IIT Bombay and a management graduate from IIM Calcutta with over 22 years of experience in the corporate world, primarily in finance, having worked at ADYS, ICICI, JSW and Siemens. In 2018, he transitioned to the social sector as an advisor to social purpose organizations. Ankaj is a finance leader turned entrepreneur running a SEBI registered PMS for HNI clients. With more than three decades of work experience, he has worked with corporate groups such as HDFC and Reliance as a fund manager. He is a self-confessed fitness enthusiast, plays squash, and is a regular at the Ironman and other marathons. And my last guest for the day is Sandy, who comes from a business family and ran a power loom factory before joining Spenta International, in charge of finance, compliance, administration, and accounts for 20 years. He is currently retired and, in his words, enjoying life. Once again, welcome to the show, guys. Um, now, 2020 has truly been a bizarre year and the Cooperative Housing Society, or RWA, has suddenly found itself front and center in managing lockdown guidelines and keeping neighbors safe and healthy. Ankaj, as a committee member, there's no positional authority over other members of the society. How did you socialize the guidelines given this fact? And are there any instances that were particularly challenging? So, Manisha, that's a very interesting and a very intriguing question. Uh, how do you uh, ensure compliance with authority? I think the short answer to this is that if you can't pull your rank, you need to earn the respect. And uh, there are four or five uh, factors which are deeply entwined, which really uh, come into play in this whole uh, earn the respect uh, scenario. The first of the, them is uh, alignment of interest. So you have to make sure as a committee that the interest of all uh, members of the society are aligned properly. So it should not happen. And this is actually one of the biggest uh, pitfalls that if uh, the interests of the committee members or specific members in the committee are not completely aligned with the, with the entire society residents and members, that is one of the reasons why some of the societies face challenges while implementing decisions that they take. Second is uh, transparency uh, and uh, effective communication. So while you can communicate your decisions to people, uh, uh, it is fair to let them know how you came and arrived at these decisions. What debates did you have? What factors did you consider? So these are important uh, things that uh, one needs to put out uh, to uh, the general public there to be able to get their buy-in uh, to the decisions that you are taking. So to give you some of these personal anecdotes, uh, in terms of uh, alignment of interest, so along with squash, I also play tennis. And there's been a lot of talk about tennis being a non-contact sport playing, uh, being played outside and not in a uh, closed door environment. And that whether it should be allowed in this kind of present situation or not. So while I play tennis myself, uh, I don't think that it is in the larger interest of the community because there's still some contact. You might use the same balls and things like that. And how do you control people? So you might put in rules saying that only two people at a time, but how do you control, monitor, and things like that? So, and then again, this whole thing about if you open one spot, why not the other? So while my personal interest might be there to uh, sort of open up uh, tennis as soon as possible, but because it's not in the interest of the community, I've actually been fighting against my friends and fellow players 
to say that this is not the right time to open up uh, this call. Uh, the third uh, factor that I wanted to bring into play is uh, demonstration of sincerity, with which I mean that you need to have a rule-based system. So you can't have ad hoc decisions that are coming or ad hoc situations and your reactions to them. So if you if you uh, put in processes uh, and rules and you follow them uh, for everybody, including yourself and uh, for other committee members, then I think people understand. So while some particular rule or a situation or a circumstance might not agree with a particular individual, but because it's rule based, they understand that and they will. Do. So somebody gains at some point in time, somebody else gains at another. Another one is you have to lead by example. So again, I'll give you a small personal anecdote. So I work in the wealth management scope, portfolio management business. It's an uh, essential service, just like banking. Uh, it's a financial service. But it's been more than uh, two months now. And while I could have gone to office uh, saying I'm in essential services, I haven't stepped out except for once. And I will explain to you why once I went out of the building. So one is managed as much as possible. People watch you very closely if you are uh, in the committee or in the position of powers. Are you also uh, adhering to the rules? Are you doing the right things at the right time? It becomes very, very important. So, so you tell somebody else to do something and you yourself have a different set of rules for yourself. If you go to the gate and if you pass around, maybe you can't pull your rank with uh, other committee members, but uh, you probably can pull your rank on the security staff that is uh, standing at the gate. And so, so you, you shut around at them and you take an exit. Uh, you can do that, but uh, people will be watching you. And the next time you come with, uh, with some decision, with you, they might not really uh, follow that very close. And the last, I think, is a show of commitment. And uh, so in a, in a company, you have a chain of command, uh, you have uh, you know, seniors that you can go to if there is a problem. In a housing society, uh, everybody is a CEO, everybody has an equal right. But also similarly, uh, when somebody has a problem, uh, unless they can go or reach out to friends with something which is more uh, legal uh, or something which they don't know where to go, one of the places they want to reach out to is the managing committee, saying that maybe somebody from the managing committee can help them or guide them as to what to do in this situation. And if that is the time that you really have to commit. It might not be uh, the best thing for you to do at that point in time. You might need to spend a lot of time in an office. But you need to do that to earn the respect of that individual as well as the society as a whole so that people uh, look up to you and you earn that respect. And, and in that, the personal anecdote, which I wanted to connect to is the only reason I've gone out of the building in the last two months is to take a fellow resident out to the hospital. Me and Sandy went together to a hospital. Uh, he had needed to be admitted to the ICU at that point in time. COVID was very much prevalent uh, and we were all scared. Uh, and there was a complete lockdown at that point in time, not the easing up which happened uh, recently. And uh, the hospital itself had a COVID bin. So the family, his family was worried, my family was worried, but it needed to be done. So I think these, these factors are important. Uh, you need to demonstrate this. Uh, it's, a, it's not an event, it's a process. Over a period of time, people understand that you are looking after their best interests. And so when rules come in, they should not, we do not agree with them completely and personally. They still will respect them because they know that it's in the past. That's it. I've also made a mental note to ask you, how do you play squash and tennis at the same time? But I will come back to that later. So, <laughs> okay, so um, Prasad, with so many different yeah. guidelines, WhatsApp forwards and conflicting information, how do you ensure that you're getting accurate information? I mean, who are you guys talking to, right? Uh, experts, epidemiologists, other RWAs, authorities, and what does decision making in this group actually comprise of? Right. So firstly, thanks for uh, doing this uh, session on uh, the Planet Coalition Code Committee. I appreciate it and thanks for having me on the same. 
Uh, clearly, information is a vital resource, considering that this is a completely new phenomenon. And it's also vital because it is an input for decision making and action going forward. So uh, uh, any, any wrong information can obviously have a serious consequences. So, so when we have looked at information, uh, I think we have, uh, first of all, a little bit of a hierarchy. So I think clearly uh, at the lowest level, which we generally tend to not look at the credibility, not look, not uh, see as very credible are the WhatsApp forwards or general social media forwards. Uh, but we do tend to look at certain sources such as, you know, the Twitter handles of uh, statutory authorities, BMC, Ministry of Health, uh, PIB. PIB releases, uh, has press releases uh, which are authentic. Uh, obviously, uh, the various state governments, the various uh, uh, central government as such really have their guidelines which they release, which we look at thoroughly and uh, carefully. So, obviously, uh, we look at, therefore, sources. Uh, uh, the, the, at the very source, we look at the information, but that's fine. Yes, and as you mentioned, we do talk to uh, multiple stakeholders. Uh, we uh, look at what other housing societies, what other RWAs are doing. We, we talk to doctors. Uh, so we talk to multiple uh, stakeholders and see what are the various points of views and various information, soft and hard, that uh, we can get from them before arriving uh, at, a, at information. So that's uh, one. So for example, on the information front, uh, uh, I'll uh, just uh, put down an anecdote here. Uh, one of the residents uh, got stuck in uh, uh, outside of uh, PG uh, during the lockdown. And unfortunately, that place became a containment zone. At a point in time, it was lifted and it uh, ceased to be a containment zone. And the resident made a submission that, uh, that she be allowed to return. When we checked uh, for, for, that, uh, for this place in containment zone on the BMC website, we saw that it was uh, still a containment zone. So we are a little confused. And so I decided that uh, let us check as to what is the reality. I spoke to the secretary of that building and he mentioned that it has been lifted from the containment zone, but BMC website takes two to three days to update. I then decided to speak to even BMC and we spoke to BMC and they also mentioned that yes, it is removed as a containment zone. It will be updated shortly. So that gave us a lot of uh, confidence. But we also got additional inputs from both these sources as to how should we as Planet Goldrich look at somebody uh, who's residing there. And based on that, based on this information, and based on the inputs that we got from these sources, we took, I would say, the appropriate decision. And even the resident was, I think, uh, cooperative in that sense. So it was a situation where I think we were able to handle well. Uh, coming to the decision making, uh, 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 we at Planet Goderesh have five different societies corresponding to the five different towers. So we are five different legal entities with their own MCs. Here, what we have done is we have come together and we have decided that instead of having individual tower-wise rules, we'll have single rules for Planet Goderesh as a whole. And it's not that anybody can follow their own rules, make and follow their own rules. So therefore, the committee is is discussing everything together, implementing all the measures together, and taking all of the decisions, approvals, etc. together. Within that, it's it's a majority decision typically uh, of uh, three uh, at least three towers uh, for the five state. But even within that, I think it's not as if that uh, one will always uh, get bulldozed uh, if one is in minority. I I I'll recite a specific uh, incident. So there was a case uh, where somebody. Uh, there was a resident who was outside and uh, she was returning, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember the situation correctly. And uh, Sandy, uh, obviously, on behalf of the resident, who was a tower, uh, his tower resident, put up the request and three towers agreed to it. But one of the towers said that, you know, they, they feel that there should be some uh, uh, quarantining or some, some such thing. Or, uh, or, or there should be some social distance, etc. So there was a suggestion one of the towers. So even though Sandy was well within his right to uh, not take that uh, input, he advised it uh, to the resident, and the resident also accepted it. And it, it kind of 
became a better uh, decision, a better action as a result of that input. So I would say while the on paper the uh, decision making is majority, I think we still look at inputs based on the quality of the inputs rather than simply whether three towers have given the inputs. So, uh, so these are the things, and I would say some of the parameters that we look in the decision making, considering the nature of uh, COVID, is what is the risk of uh, inf infection. Uh, you know, so we have tried to reduce uh, many to many interactions. Uh, obviously, the standard measures of social distancing, hygiene, etc., those have been taken. Uh, for example, on e-commerce deliveries, initially we actually stopped even e-commerce deliveries because of uh, apprehension on the parcels, uh, etc., spreading infection. But later on, as we realized that uh, when we look at the risk versus uh, advantage or risk versus benefit uh, equation, then we restarted uh, the e-commerce uh, deliveries. I think that has also gone up. So these are some of the parameters that uh, we have looked at uh, in the district. Seems pretty comprehensive, and uh, you know, surely you would have had some sort of powwow, right? Uh, it seems as of now that everything's gone like placid water, but uh, I don't hear any disagreements. No, so, uh, at the committee level, there are uh, definitely very strong debates, and uh, there have been uh, situations where uh, you know the disagreement has has become rather uh, difficult to handle. But I think in the end, uh, we accept that it is not that people are wanting to uh, you know, debate and disagree just for the sake of being difficult, but because uh, this is a situation which requires multiple views, multiple inputs, and therefore in the end, uh, it is the quality of that inputs and what the logic uh, that is there is important rather than whether there is a personal issue uh, between the various uh, committee members. So fights do happen. I am not at all denying that. But in the end, I think somehow we reach uh, the right common ground. Sounds like a good democracy. So Nidhi, I'd like to uh, bring you in over here. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the whole evolving nature of this pandemic, what does planning for such a situation actually entail? And what are the various aspects the committee has actually taken into consideration? Thanks, Manisha, for your question. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so when it all started in um, Jan, Feb, uh, most of us thought that uh, worst case, it will be like SARS, what we saw in 2003, something that probably won't uh, affect us Indians with our strong immunity and, uh, you know, our warm climate, etc. It's only later now we are realizing that what we are going through is historical. It's once in a century event, uh, something like the Spanish flu. So when the committee started working, uh, we didn't have a clear roadmap or a set template. And uh, there was no proven approach, you know, that this is what you need to do to plan for the safety of residents. So as we went about uh, planning and framing the policies, uh, the endeavor always was to frame responses which were based on the government policies from time to time. The information, like Prasad mentioned, um, that was available from reliable sources. And the constant feedback that we uh, got from residents. I remember when we first decided to regulate the internal traffic in the building, and one of the many measures we took was to stop the part-time house help. Now, at that time, we, I mean, we took that step, but we kept wondering if the measures that we were taking were over stringent. Now, in hindsight, I don't think we did anything which was, uh, you know, unnecessary or uh, which was over stringent, um, over stringent, so to say. So, like you said, in an evolving situation as such as this pandemic, it was important to be dynamic and adapt our policies. So, we have done that constantly. We have shown flexibility and also restraint wherever required. I remember an uh, instant uh, where one of the residents had a washing machine breakdown. Now we had put a, we had put restrictions on all entries, but we soon realized that there cannot be a blanket ban on uh, you know everything and certain essential things like services like repairman and technician will have to be 
allowed. So therefore, we said, okay, we'll allow this, but subject to address checks to ensure that the person is not coming from a containment zone. Um, another instance uh, I'll tell you is we, had we have this garden for dogs where uh, the dogs get their uh, daily exercise. So we had closed the dog garden because uh, there were too many maids, too many dogs, kids coming in to play with the dogs. Now, subsequently, we got a lot of repeat requests from all the pet parents saying that their dogs aren't getting sufficient exercise. So uh, we heard them. We said, okay, we open it. But this time, two dogs at a time, fixed time slots, no maids, has to be accompanied by the pet parents. The, they ensure that no kids come in to play so that, you know, we conform to the social distancing uh, guidelines. So we've constantly taken feedback from residents, adapted our responses. Uh, throughout this lockdown, we have ensured that, uh, in fact, for essentials in other societies, uh, people have to step out at least once or twice a week to procure it. Throughout the lockdown, we have planned so as to ensure that they get their continuous supply of essentials, whether it is... Uh, you know, groceries, vegetables. So Reliance and Dmart uh, uh, had made available daily groceries and veggies. So we've done bulk deliveries of everything from mangoes to dry fruits. So the whole idea has been to ensure that a resident can get their uh, essentials within the complex without really having to step out. Now the government has uh, started announcing relaxations. There could be a possible spike in cases. So we are now focused on planning for a situation, uh, you know, what if there's a positive case in the building? I hope it doesn't happen. But uh, if it happens, so therefore we have uh, procured an oximeter, pulse oximeter for early detection and also an oxygenator to stabilize the person till he gets a hospital bed. And uh, all this planning and execution would not have yielded results if it wasn't for the support of all the residents, you know, so it's been a superb team effort. Yeah, so that's where we are. Well, I can vouch for I can vouch for the fact that it's been very well uh, organized and uh, very well planned. Um, and yeah, I think uh, all the residents have definitely understood, appreciated, and supported. Um, you know, the, the planning that's actually been done. I have a difficult question for uh, Sandy actually. Um, so, Sandy, we've all heard horror stories of RWAs being high-handed, arbitrary in the decision-making. Um, how do you manage balancing conflicting needs? Now, I know Prasad touched upon it, and very diplomatically, he said it was all like a good democracy. Um, you know, but I, I'm sure there are stories there. How did you manage the uh, you know, conflicting needs, points of view, demands of society members, and did it ever get out of hand? Now, these are not horror stories. And this is not a tough question. To just answer it very, very simple, that these are facts. These are not horror stories. You hear all these in every single society. So why do you, why do you have a committee? The committee is formed by all the members and uh, few of them are selected. Few of them are selected knowingly that there will be horror stories in the uh, future. But then also not everybody uh, stands for the elections and only a few of them stand and uh, we elect them. In our case in Planet Godre, I don't think we ha actually have a uh, say like a election election because there are only seven members standing for the elections and seven of them are elected. So it goes out of hand for sure. But uh, what happens is like our COVID committee, uh, we are almost working 24 seven. It's like we get messages at 12 o'clock in the night. Also, if there is some incoming member or some emergency for a member to go out, the security has been very, very categorically uh, instructed not to allow any person, whether it be any medical uh, emergencies. Also the person, they call us any of the COVID members and we then allow them after seeing the situation. So uh, how to handle this and how we have been handling it is we have been harsh on people. It's all just for the benefit of the residents, nothing else. If I'm not allowing somebody to go out is only for the betterment of the person. 
and at large our society here uh, we have almost like 2000 plus members plus uh, domestic helps staying in pg plus we have almost like something around 35 40 staffs staying in pg from day one we never allowed any staff to uh, you know travel from their work, uh, from their house to our society we made arrangements for everybody in the society and we are spending everything on them now harsh why i am using that word harsh is only for the reason that everybody thinks that their work is always important there it's human tendency here that i am important and my work is the utmost priority here so we have to see which is the priority and what are not the priorities there like if somebody has to just deposit a check in the bank we help them we have our staff we have the motorcycles they help them to deposit the checks that's not a really a, this thing uh, what do you call the urgent matter here but people take it as a urgent matters here so this becomes harsh for the member thinking that ki uh, they the members themselves think that we have been harsh on them but if you see it's not harsh and uh, coming back to your point about how to handle all these things and all almost 95% of the residents have been cooperative completely cooperative with us there have been few incidences like smuggling in maids at quarter to 3 in the night obviously so obviously if it is not a uh, uh, allowed thing so these are things which we get a call at quarter to 3 also in the night from the security asking that whether we should allow the person or not now if we have not allowed maids for any president it's not right for us to allow one maid for one person like yesterday there was a fire in one of the buildings in kaf parade one of the uh, members uh, uh, mother and uh, her maid was stuck in the uh, building and the fire brigade vacated the whole building so we had to take a harsh decision we had to take a decision against all our principles uh, for allowing her mother and the maid into our building only for overnight early morning 7 o'clock she messaged me that they have uh, already exited the building and they have gone back so you know this kind of a decision you have to take so you have to balance it according to the priorities and according to the uh, urgent need of a person so yeah touch wood till now we have really managed to do it well we have uh, say out of 378 families staying in pg we must be having 358 families happy families probably 20 families who are not really sad but unhappy here and now a question for all four of you um you know lockdown guidelines are very clear now we are in the begin again mode uh, what do you see moving from here on for the next 12 to 18 months what what will life look like for a resident look i think uh, it's another critical phase that we are entering because so far what was happening is in the initial phase the government itself was pretty strict about the lockdown now we have reached a stage where the government is shifting focus from containment of covid to opening up of the economy and uh, obviously that's a very different stance and as a result they will continue to open up unfortunately it is coming at a stage when the cases especially in mumbai and maharashtra are rising so had this opening up been happening or happened when the cases were reducing then i think there would be no issue but it is happening at the wrong time so i think we as at pg will have to be very very careful in looking at the measures that we take so that we don't go overboard in, if we open up too fast uh, then uh, we could uh, you know uh, end up undoing a lot of the effort uh, in the 70 days of keeping pg covid free so but still there are various voices and one voice is that uh, look let us uh, uh, learn to live with it uh, you know we need to open up etc so uh, there are pushes and pulls but it seems that what we will do is a more a, a more slower opening up than what the government is doing and hopefully that will uh, serve us well uh, so uh, i was saying that you know there are um, 
two or three very important things to look at going forward. One is, you know, we talked about how we were trying to control the main gate, which is basically the uh, entry and the exits, the exits and the re-entries. Uh, so that has been uh, sort of uh, relaxed a fair bit also because uh, a lot of people need to go out uh, for work. Uh, that's been allowed by the government and we need to abide by what the government says. So that's been relaxed. But there are other aspects. So uh, starting from people who had live-in maids or would now want to have live-in maids. So it's basically a one-time transition from in, outside the gate to inside the gate. But that live-in maid who comes in and either was with them before or wants to come in new, uh, we don't know uh, what situation that live-in maid has been in. And it is risky for somebody to come in for that family as well as for the community in general. So, so that's one thing that's debatable, but at some point in time, we will have to allow. But if people are used to live-in mates, uh, then it's been a fairly long time that they've been carrying on on their own. So at some point in time, that needs to be allowed. How it will be allowed, what kind of quarantining, social distancing, these are things that we need to work out, work on. The other uh, two aspects are about part-timers, which are people who come in and go out. Uh, so part-time mates and, and drivers. These are the, the key requirements of people. Uh, they've had mates and drivers. Uh, many of us continue to uh, engage them, pay them because uh, we believe that's the right thing to do. And we would like them to come back uh, when it's uh, safe enough. But when is it going to be safe enough? What kind of measures do we take? And they, they're not going to be one time. So then the main gate needs to be monitored very, very closely. There are, uh, there can be asymptomatic cases, which unfortunately you can't do anything about. But if there are symptoms, they need to be caught at the earliest uh, possible time. So again, there's a lot of debate going on on that as to when and how we will open up for mates and drivers. And the last category that I see is basically visitors into the society. So, so they are, uh, what, do I, what should I say, they're not essential, essential. So they're aspirational, so to say that, you know, I want my, uh, you know, so friend to come in, I want to have a party. So it's, it's a bit distant, but at some point in time, that will also have to be allowed. So we are already thinking about all of these and to see what measures we need to put in place, uh, what kind of deployment we need to do to ensure that uh, the, the chances of anybody catching the infection are reduced. To minimum. Unfortunately, even now or later, it cannot be brought down to zero, the probability. But we So I'll just add to what uh, Pankaj and Prasad said. So I echo their views. Um, essentially, the elephant in the room is uh, house elves. So I think... Uh, at last count, we had about we we uh, think there are about nine hundred to thousand people uh, that we see an influx of when you know we open the gates to these uh, part-time households. So and most of them, as we know, don't stay in self-contained houses. Elderly population in the building, so uh, we need to strike a balance. Um, and I think as a PG resident, what you can expect is. Uh, um, it will be slightly slower opening than what our neighboring buildings have done, but be rest assured, have faith on the committee. We've taken measures to keep you safe and uh, we'll continue to do that uh, going forward. Mask has become the new dressing for you now. So you should have the mask on all the time when you're out of your house at least. I think that's all. So put, so put your mask face on is what um, you know the COVID committee wants to close with. Thank you so much, guys. Don't show your smile. <laughs>